is called Pocahontas Inn. This is the sixth installment in our series. I'm Linda Bowen. I'm a founding member of Five Rivers Historic Preservation, and Five Rivers sponsors these, these events. Our cameraman and director is John Allen French, who's the current officer in Five Rivers Historic Preservation Team. And both of our producers, Allison Shackle and Nathan Camp, are on assignment, so they won't be with us tonight. Um, I want to tell everybody that if you have an interest in history, if you uh, just love Pocahontas and love Randolph County, we'd love for you to join us in our organization. There's a whole lot to do historic related in Pocahontas and Randolph County, and most of it's a lot of fun, so we'd love for you to join us. Get in touch with me or John Allen, and I think I'm being attacked by the birds. <laughs> Tonight, Pocahontas is... Pocahontas is proud of our places of worship and proud of our religious heritage. And tonight we were at our St. Paul Catholic Church and we're going to hear a lot about the history of the church and we're also going to take a tour of the interior of the church. But first we're going to be talking about the grotto, which is behind me here. And I want to introduce our tour guides tonight. You want to come on over? We have Kathy Jarrett and also Rainer D. Clark. So go ahead and explain to us uh, about the beautiful grotto and then the, also the church. Okay. The, uh, the grotto is, uh, our grandpa Smith brought some pictures tonight, some Columbus meeting. It showed pictures of this and said we need to build a grotto on this sacred ground. And, uh, <clears throat> We as Catholics believe that the Blessed Sacrament is the true body and blood of Christ, and all the uh, chalice and patents and so forth are washed, and the water is just drained under the church. It doesn't go into any sewer. And this, this is where the water had been drained, because this was the site of the original church. It was a clapboard church made out of cypress. The logs were all uh, cut other side of Donovan, floated down the river uh, to a sawmill down here, and it's pretty well done all labor, and that's the reason why. But uh, this was during the Depression, 1933, when this was built, and people just didn't have jobs. And we got volunteer labor. My grandpa Schmidt was the one that designed it, and one that. Uh, was supervised and did nearly all the building. And uh, it was done in 1933. And it seemed like we couldn't even hardly keep laborers up here because especially the Protestant people in town said, my goodness gracious, said, why are all these Catholics working and we can't get a job? Well, it was blamed on the Blessed Mother. She was giving them jobs for building a grotto and dedicating it to her. And. Uh, the rocks all came from uh, Philip Boss Farm out on Mill Creek, and they were hauled in by wagon, and uh, Nitro Columbus bought the material, the, the sand well, the sand was scraped out of the creek, but uh, the mortar to put it together, and Grandpa and my dad pretty well built it, Grandpa Schmidt, Kathy's great-grandpa. Do you have something to say, Kathy? <laughs> So Uncle Rainer is my uncle, and uh, the, as he said, it was built by his grandfather, my great-grandfather. And this grotto was actually built on the site of the original church, which was a wood frame church that, that sat here and was used from 1868 until the early 1900s when this church was completed. The, the grotto is uh, modeled after the grotto at Lourdes, France, where uh, St. Bernadette, and that statue represents her, um, saw and the Blessed Virgin Mary appeared to her. And uh, the site in France, in Lourdes, France, is uh, famous for, for many miracles. And uh, so that's what it was modeled after. I said 1933 and 1932. 
So would you like to step over to yes. the church? Okay. Yes. Um, Most of the time when you build a building, the first thing everyone wants to do is put a good footing down. Without a good footing, there's no foundation. Believe it or not, there's no footing under this church. Was it built on rock? It was rocks hauled up here, enormous rocks uh -huh. that were laid together. Wow. And then the building came up on top of it. Wow. But there is no concrete footing of any kind under it. It's all, all rock from all the way up. Wow. That's amazing. And there's no cracks either. Mm -hmm. Originally, when the church was built, they didn't use mortar to put the brick uh, uh, stones together. They just used silica sand, and a lot of it was from the rubbing and scrubbing on the the stone to get them in shape where they could lay so tight together. They just put a small bed between it and there was no mortar in between it. And when it come a lot of blowing rain, the rain would come through the wall. <laughs> <laughs> and they plastered the inside and it still came through and the plaster came off so they went the other route. Mm -hmm. And Venus Barre, uh, Put the roping on the church. Mm -hmm. All the roping on the rock was done by Vitas Barre. Is that cosmetic? Is that just cosmetic? No, it's anything? not just cosmetic. It serves a purpose. Mm -hmm. It filled in all the cracks mm -hmm. and sealed it so mm -hmm. the okay. water won't go in. Of course, we keep the stone sealed with Thompson's water sealer now mm -hmm. so it doesn't get uh, water through it. And then there's polyurethane sheeting on the walls inside lath on uh, strips and uh, paneling on top of that now. Rainer, could you tell us about where the rocks came from? The rocks came from down on Cedar Street where the old house is down there in the, where he first crossed the creek. Mm -hmm. They were all hammered out of the rock down there. That was the rock quarry. They uh, drilled the holes with the hammer and a drill and then heavy power tools mm -hmm. and uh, they'd blast the rock out and then they would saw it mm -hmm. have a rock saw and they would saw it and that's how they get it smooth enough that they could lay them together that mm -hmm. they wouldn't fall apart mm -hmm. and slide here and there mm -hmm. and the, to get the uh, rocks up that high you see how big they are enormous uh -huh. and see how deep the walls are uh, they had a scaffold built around on the inside of the church and on the outside that was like a screw. Huh. And they put a sack over the mule's head and put the rocks on a sled and put sand on the sled so it would roll and take the mules up there and drag the rock up there to put them in place. Up the scaffold? The right. mules? That's how they That's got the rocks up there. Mm -hmm. they, there's no way they didn't have cranes mm -hmm. and things like that back sure. then. And this was 1904 or no, three, earlier two? Earlier than that. Earlier. The, uh, the, I thought it was the uh, cornerstone, but it's not. It's on the corner of the church back here. But it's when the church was dedicated, which is 1898. Wow. So the church was actually started prior to that. Mm -hmm. I think it took, I think around five or six years it took to complete. Wow the whole church. I would think so. So if the dedication was 98, they go back quite mm -hmm. a bit farther than that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And this big tree back here that we're finally losing was about so big around. Wow. And you don't bury a tree without killing it. But they took all the scrap rock and they piled it around that tree uh -huh. to keep from getting the soil right against it and mm -hmm. did it a little bit at a time. Mm -hmm. So they got their fill all the way up and it didn't kill that tree. It's still there. Oh, that's there. wonderful. But the lightning has struck it so many times now that it's it's about to give up the ghost. We keep thinking that this is the last year and then it comes right back. Well, it, it looks healthy on the right side of it, for <laughs> sure. So that's, that's wonderful. Yeah. Shall we go on in? Let's go on mm -hmm. in.
have some pictures here of the uh, construction, and I don't know if you'll be able to pick that up with your camera or not. We may have to do otherwise. But uh, these pews were built by Bill Voss. Wow. I didn't realize that. This is the original hardwood floor, still in use. This is the main altar. At one time, all the masses were said with the priest facing the altar and his back to the people. And with the Second Vatican Council, they thought it would be a good idea to take the communion rail out. There was a communion rail right across this step up here. And when the people went to communion, they would kneel on that step and receive the communion at the communion rail. Now we receive it by hand and we walk up and take it like that. And the altar, the lower altar that you see is part of the communion rail. And the little corner tables back there and here, those tables are the gates that open the communion rail. So we didn't, and the, the podium is made out of marble from it. And when his church was built, a lady here in the parish wasn't real wealthy, but she was of good means. And she donated the altar. She paid for every bit of that. And when she died, the parish had to bury her. She didn't have enough money after she donated all that. You talk about dedication to the Lord now, she did have it. Now, part, a part of the altar, or maybe all of the altar, was um, brought here from Europe, is that right? From, from Italy or maybe Switzerland? Italy. Italy. Mm -hmm. Can you show us that part or tell us which part it is? I think all of it. All, all of it? it? All wow. Of it. And she paid for that? Or It's Carrera Marble. Oh, and wow. It was, uh, it's from Carrera, Italy, as far as I know. Mm -hmm. And uh, she, I'm assuming, had it, you know, ordered it from there and had it brought over. And uh, uh, as Uncle Raymond said, she, uh, she donated all of her money to the church. Mm -hmm. She... Uh, helped to found the church or to, to build this church with her wealth and uh, she died a pauper. Mm -hmm. And was this at the time that the church was built or around that time, the turn of the century? Mm -hmm. Wow. Wow, that's, that's, it's beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. These two are altars also. That's called the high altar. And these are the lower altars. And one's dedicated to the Blessed Mother and the Child Jesus. And the one on the right is dedicated to St. Joseph. So the Holy Family is represented there. And you notice in the middle of the main altar up there with the crucifixes over it, uh -huh. with the green drapery over it, Yes. it's a solid gold tabernacle. And that more or less represents the Ark of the Covenant. And the Blessed Sacrament is kept there in that tabernacle at all times. So when we come in our church, we walk right into church with Jesus right in front of us. Mm -hmm. It's sure a wonderful thing. Yes. And these little candle holders, one over there on that wall, one on that wall, one on the sacristy wall, and then there's one on this back wall. Those candles are lit once a year to celebrate the dedication of this church, the anniversary of the celebration of the anniversary of the church. What is the um, anniversary date of the church, or, or month? We just had it. So, so June or July? June? Mm -hmm. Well, he's got the camera pointed up there at the at the uh, pipe oh, organ. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's a combination of three different pipe organs. The 
original pipe organ was a little eight-tube organ, and uh, it was all wood structure. Of course, it had a big ballast in it. Didn't have electricity back when that thing went in, so you had to pump it by hand. And, and uh, my mother and my two great uncles and one great aunt were the choir here. And I'd have to come up here and pump that organ when they'd have <laughs> choir practice. Now I get so tired of that. <laughs> but it sure pretty well engulfs the, uh, in 1950, the organ had gotten in such bad shape. In 1950, when Father Hinckley was here, Monsignor Hinckley, uh, we bought a new organ for the church. I remember how we took pledges and five thousand dollars for that organ. There, people thought, "Gosh, that's that's ridiculous to pay for an organ." But it lasted pretty good. But and it was doing all right. It just, you know, it wasn't a champion. But uh, Ed Cox happened to find this organ that was being dismantled in an Episcopal church in Little Rock, and he found out we could get it just for ship, crating it up, shipping it up here. Mm -hmm. So now we have a combination, actually, of three different organs up there. Mm -hmm. And this is a great organ. I mean, it can shake the windows in here. Well, we have a question here uh, or to ask you to be sure and talk about the windows, the stained glass right. windows, which I know, I know you're going to anyway, but. Yeah. That was the next thing on the agenda. Right. Uh, these windows were dedicated uh, to individuals for the different saints. And they were donated by different families, as you can see on the scroll on the bottom there. Uh, it has the names of the people that donated the windows. And uh, since then, we put the plexiglass on the outside of it. It's Lexan, it's not plexiglass. It's the same thing you'd use in the airplane windows. But uh, that's the Geschwent family there. Mm -hmm. but, uh, now, some of these windows, or maybe all of them, were imported from Switzerland and Italy, is that correct? Munich, Germany. Is Munich, right. Germany. Okay, Germany. excuse me, I, I get a little bit mixed up on this. But um, even back in Dr., I mean, Father Wilde's time, they were imported, is that right? Yes. Back in the early 1900s. Well, like around 1900. Right. right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, that must have been quite a feat to import. <laughs> The windows, or maybe they put them together after they got here, I don't know, but it came on a ship, obviously. They must have. Mm -hmm. I don't really know. Mm -hmm. This little cabinet here is where we keep the chrism, the holy oil, mm -hmm. that is used for baptisms and anointing. And uh, <clears throat> you know, the holy water fonts on each side of the doors as you come in. They don't have a tray in them now because of this plague that we're having. We're not, we're not taking holy water anymore, but it, that holy water is blessed uh, on Holy Saturday with the Easter vigil. And uh, while you got your camera looking in that direction, these little boxes over here in the corner, over here and there, are the confessionals. Oh. Mm -hmm. I'll slip in there after a while if y'all want to get me to go to confession. <laughs> <laughs> oh. I don't think John Allen, qualify. you go right ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it qualified. No. Of course, that room there is a cry room for the babies, which people don't use it. Mm -hmm. Well, um, can you tell us about the, on the walls there, the white um, window boxes or the Stations of the Cross? What's the history of those? Well, that's exactly what it is. It's the Stations of the Cross. As far as the history is concerned, I don't know what, where the history would be about it, but it's, it's been in all church for years. And oh, years well, and I years. mean the history of these particular ones. Were they carved uh, a special way or imported somewhere? I think somewhere? they're cast. Oh, I see. Mm -hmm. They're cast. Uh -huh. And, of course, it goes from the... Uh, when Jesus condemned to death and when he gets his cross falls the first time, mm -hmm. it goes all the way around the well, church and then back up the other side till the crucifixion and then when Jesus is taken down from the cross. And mm -hmm. yeah. well, but 
but this is a real good source of meditation. It's not that we idolize that piece of, uh, of mm -hmm. artwork up there. It's because of what it makes us think. Yes. And if you stop and look at, like, and the prayers that the church has, that goes with these stations of the cross, it'll make your hair stand on sin sometimes mm -hmm. when you think about what Jesus did mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. for us and Egypt. Yeah. God could have just said no. <laughs> he could have done things differently. Mm -hmm. But sin is so hideous to him mm -hmm. that it took his son to atone for those sins. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He yeah. sent his only son to atone for those sins. Mm -hmm. And that's how hideous sin is to Jesus, mm -hmm. to God. Uh -huh. And these yeah. stations of the cross represent uh, what Jesus went through. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, Rainer, can you tell us, is this very much as the church looked, has the church changed in appearance, the no. interior? No. no, the only thing we put the panning on it, covered up the plaster, the plaster that had fallen off the walls. And uh, of course, we've got carpet down the runways that we didn't have before. We had the lanterns that wrapped the wall that broke mm -hmm. down on side. And the priest actually went up the steps and then he gave his sermon to the standing up high. But we don't we don't have that anymore. Uh -huh. Yeah, I've seen that in, in some churches yes. where the priest is in a like a little alcove kind of thing. church and the history of the parish is so interesting and I don't know if you want to tell a little more about Father O'Kane who was the first priest here uh, I think Kathy was talking about that earlier and then and then on to Father Weibel and the Father Weibel and the school that he started and, and the, the Benedictine nuns and all that right. um, the, the parish was actually founded in, in 1868 and it was founded by a uh, Father O'Kane, who was uh, actually uh, in the Confederate Army, and he was uh, on a uh, journey, and he met up with some businessmen from Pocahontas, and uh, they encouraged him to come to Pocahontas, and uh, he was a very eloquent speaker, and he was very famous for that, and he, had, he was speaking as a missionary on the train. And so they invited him to come to Pocahontas. They let people know that he was coming, and everyone came to a, a store where he gave a speech. There were and, only two uh, Catholic families here at the time. There were only two Catholic families here at the time. And so Father O'Kane was a hit. Yeah. And uh, the town fathers told him that they would build a church if he would establish a church here. And they helped him uh, to petition the, uh, the church, the Bishop of Arkansas, mm -hmm. and that's when uh, the Catholic Church was founded in 1868. And we spoke earlier about the uh, wooden church that was out where the grotto is now, mm -hmm. that was the original church. Mm -hmm. And Father Lava was here for, for quite a few years, and the church grew. There were quite a few converts. Father O'Kane, yeah, Father, Father O'Kane. Mm -hmm. Um, one of the converts was the man who actually donated the land that the church and the school sits on. And his name was James Marvin. Mm -hmm. And the, we call him, or he's called Colonel Marvin, but we don't know that he was actually a colonel. But that's what the old timers called him. And uh, when he died, he asked to be buried on the grounds. And uh, they actually moved his wife and his children and his wife's uh, friend who uh, they had all died um, of uh, I guess malaria and oh, so they moved those graves here and uh, Colonel Marvin asked for the nuns to take care of the graves so their, their graves are actually still on the church grounds mm -hmm. and they've been moved but they're still here on the church grounds mm -hmm. and after Father O'Kane left I'm not sure what year that was, um, but it was, it was. He was only here about three or four years, mm -hmm. and then he was gone. We didn't have a priest here for three or four years. Had a priest for several years. And a lot of the Catholics and people that had joined the church when the Father of Cain was here went to Little Rock. To 
Took to church. Mm -hmm. I went with him, moved with him. Uh -huh. But the congregation or the parish held together by the per parishioners, is that correct? Right. During that uh, period of time. That, that's where O'Kane got his name. Yeah. Uh -huh. I think it was a. Uh, uh, <laughs> John Allen's from O'Kane. <laughs> um, yeah, it was a railroad stop, and right. it was quite an honor, I think, at that time for a railroad, which was new, for a stop to be named after someone. So he must have been quite a well-respected uh, person around here, and I know he was. Mm -hmm. Everyone loved both the priests. I, mm -hmm. I thought it was funny that the property over there were Dr. Dick Clark built his house. Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, plan of the property shows those spots, uh, lots for sale that are like 16 feet by 8 feet. And he said, uh, Johnny, <laughs> what's his name? He used to be the city county clerk. Johnny, I can't call his name now. No, not James Chapley, no. Yeah, Jim, Jim Shiley, yeah. Mm -hmm. he, uh, he said he may have get, been a good preacher and a good Christian man, but he sure didn't know a thing about subdivision. <laughs> about making a subdivision, exactly. But the reason why he did that uh -huh. was a lot of people that were kind of down on the luck and living on the Mississippi River up around St. Louis and places like that, mm -hmm. they didn't have any money, couldn't get a job. Mm -hmm. immigrants and, and if they could prove that they had a piece of property somewhere they would help the government help move them mm -hmm. so he'd give them a deed to this little piece of property big enough to put a wagon on mm -hmm. and a team and, and that's how he got a lot of the recruits immigrants to come here mm -hmm. and hold us mm -hmm. because of that little old lots of uh -huh. didn't know what right. he was doing. Now, now you're, you're talking about Father Weibel now? Right. He, he did the main recruitment of the immigrants, is that right. is that right? And I read that he he traveled to Philadelphia and he traveled to New York City and everywhere to, to, to entice the immigrants who were coming and fleeing Europe at the time to, I think I'm <laughs> sorry, uh, to come here. So, um, and, and all the families so many of the families have stayed and are still here. Well, you're, you're part of it. I mean, both of you are part of it, part of the families. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was reading about it today when they came here in mm -hmm. 1870. Mm -hmm. Now, Father Weibel also started the school. Is that correct? Right. Father mm -hmm. Weibel started a school here. <clears throat> in fact, it's a, I'm pretty sure it's the building where Eddie Mae Heron is now, the original building, and started for colored people. Black people weren't getting any education at all. Mm -hmm. And of course, there were some white too, but mostly black mm -hmm. people. And, and the people of, of Pocahontas got up and at and they let him know in a hurry if he's going to educate these black people, they're going to burn that building down. They did, didn't want the black mm -hmm. people to get an education. Oh, dear. And uh, they, they really made it rough mm -hmm. on them. That, that went on for two or three years, and mm -hmm. then it just died down. Yeah. Now, he also recruited the Benedictine uh, sisters here, didn't he? Right. As teachers and also as, well, s servants to the church. Or, I, don't know, I don't know how you that's say that. That's what they are. Okay, yeah. Originally, there was a two-sided log cabin back here with the walkway in the middle of it. Mm -hmm. And I have and then they added wings on each side as a common crew. And uh, of course the rest of it wasn't long. But I've got the windows that came out of that. I've got 12 or 13 of them. If anyone wants one of those windows, I'll give them to them. The convent, right. the convent the windows. Right, mm -hmm. convent windows. Wow. And, uh, uh -huh. I, oh, I read that when, Doc, when uh, Father Weibel was recruiting the nuns here to teach, that he insisted that they, that they not only be able, well, that there also be included some nuns who taught music. He right. felt that music was a very important part of education, and I, I was very impressed by, by the wisdom of that. St. Paul's used to have a complete band. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> In fact, uh, 
when I was an altar server, we invested upstairs. This is the sacristy over here, the priest sacristy, mm -hmm. and the stairway goes up upstairs, and that's where we kept our castings and work. But all those musical instruments, instruments up there, and we couldn't resist taking, especially a big old bass horn and blowing on it up there. <laughs> <laughs> we get in trouble all the time because we were a bunch of smokers start blowing those instruments. Okay. Now, um, you, this church is built on, on what you call consecrated ground or blessed ground. Right. What did, uh, did the uh, priest from Little Rock come and bless, bless the ground? or How, how did that happen here well, and also at the cemetery? The bishop uh, will do the dedication. I see. It's actually the bishop is actually, well, everything belongs to Diocese of Little Rock. We don't own anything here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, the diocese of Little Rock, which the bishop is in charge of mm -hmm. the diocese. I read that um, there were, back during the late 1800s, of course, a lot of the west of here and north of here was wilderness, and the Irish wilderness was up in Missouri, and that so many of the, of the scattered Catholics didn't have a parish. And they would bring people when they passed away to be buried here in our cemetery, uh, St. Paul Cemetery, because it was consecrated ground. There I found one, that really interesting. There was one section of the cemetery that's dedicated to the Irish Catholics. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, they were, they were brought, brought down here and buried. Uh -huh, from the Irish wilderness. Uh -huh. There was a settlement in Missouri, and I don't remember what the name of it was, but it was strictly an Irish settlement. Mm -hmm. It's just like here, uh, too many people. I know Dad was born in 1905, and uh, he went to school in sixth grade. No, it wasn't sixth grade, it was second grade in German. Mm -hmm. Grandma and Grandpa Dickert spoke German, they mm -hmm. didn't speak English. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So he started off speaking German. He thought, boy, he had that German language mastered <laughs> when they he worked in Long Ridge Air Base, he went down, he had a field with up cancer down there, and he went down there and thought, I'm going to talk to these Germans. And they said, <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was Arkansas German. <laughs> they had no idea what he was trying to say. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Oh, that's funny. Um, you were going to tell us, uh, Kathy, about the historic history journal. Now, what is it called? Yeah. The Randolph County Historical Review. That's right. Sorry. <laughs> and this has a, a really nice history of the Catholic Church by Andrew Wiley, and it's the 1965 edition. And here is the address. If anyone would like to look that up online, if you can read my scribbles. Which reminds me, our preservation group probably needs to start a new um, journal for the, our history review because I, I don't I don't think we've had that since the 60s or the oh, early 70s really? and it's right. got they've got wonderful information in it yeah I bet the library has it uh -huh. yeah I think they do but we hadn't had one since is my point I think it's such an important um, way to document our history but and there's a lot more details about the, the beginning of the church and mm -hmm. the building of the cemetery and the, the priests Mm -hmm. And uh, there's just a lot of a lot of history on this hill. Uh -huh. uh, I'm going to. You'll cheat. notice all Catholic churches are built in the shape of a cross. Oh no, I didn't know that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. now, some of the modern churches have kind of deviated away from it. You can still look at your footprint from the top if you're flying over it, and you'll see uh, there's a cross. You'll look here. We've got the bodies across here. And then the two arms here, mm -hmm. and then the sanctuary is ahead of the mm -hmm. church. And this right side over here is was built. That was the sister's chapel. Oh, that's just the, the nuns didn't go with mass or go with uh, the congregation mixed with, and they stayed with their own. And of course, the left-hand side is the sanctuary. That's where all the vestments are kept, mm -hmm. and where the priest's best. Well, we don't have any questions exactly on Facebook, but we have some interesting comments. 
and I want to read you some of the comments. Carol Edwards, I mean Julie Edwards, says, my dad, George Edwards, loved that pipe organ. Then she said, Rainer sang at my wedding. <laughs> 34 years ago, he sang for many weddings and funerals. And then Pat Carroll said, I remember the year I sang tenor with the St. Paul's Choir for Midnight Mass. At the rehearsal, the director, George Edwards, was always telling us, sing with gusto, sing with gusto. Such a great word, gusto, and George is the only person I've ever known to use that word. <laughs> so that was pretty neat. And then um, Julie is saying how much this is bringing back memories of, of, her, of her time living here and also her dad and all. And then quite a few other people are watching and really enjoying it. Uh, will someone put what that sticky note says in the comments? Yes, we will. Yes. We will do that. You'll do it when you get home. Yes. Okay, great. That sounds great. Um, well, we've gone for about 40 minutes. And if, do, is there anything, that you, anything else you can think of that might be interesting? I thought I'd ask John Allen just to take a little a slow trip around and admire the windows and the um, altar and then back around the windows before we sign off. But you all can be thinking while he's doing that, if that's all right. Would that be all right with you? Because it's so beautiful. See the lower location? Yes. That's for the... Oh, yes, of course. That's for the carry. Mm -hmm. Kids are big and volunteer to carry. Dad sang bass until the, until the house full of kids, and, and Paul D. Clark did a good job singing bass, so uh, Dad decided he would stay home with the kids and let Mama go to church and sing to Franna. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I'm going to get away from your microphone there, because it's so beautiful. This tapestry back here is... Another thing they got sound for us. stained glass windows are of the four evangelists, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They're the first two and the last two. And the middle stained glass window is St. Paul the Apostle, who is the patron of our church. And these are behind the altar, so they're not quite as visible as some of the other windows. Those are beautiful. They are. And they're priceless. Yes. We, we could never replace these. No. Just gorgeous. We're taking the windows down one at a time. And they're taking them down to the rock, taking them apart. Originally, they were just chartered together here and there. Mm -hmm. And they've got a, a new system.
Sisters Chapel, and uh, we're using it now for the Adoration Chapel. Oh, yes. And we have the Blessed Sacrament exposed there in 24-7 Adoration in church. Of course, we've had to cut it out now with the, mm -hmm. with the uh, virus. And these pews were in the, the Benedictine convent. Mm -hmm. They just had chairs and kneelers like this over here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, when they tore the convent down, when we moved the pews over here. I didn't realize that that was the Adoration Chapel. I've been in through the back door. Yeah. It's nice. Originally, this plan was not to have the candelabra there. It was supposed to have had angels. Do you want to step into the sacristy? Sure. Over here? Yes. his best mm -hmm. preparation. There's a sink there that is does the same thing. It just drains into the ground under the uh -huh. sacristy. It doesn't go into any sewer because that's where the sacred vessels are purified. Mm -hmm. And this is what is called a monstrance. That's what the blessed sacrament is exposed in. Turn around. Mm, that's beautiful. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Okay. Did you? I guess uh, with that, we'll conclude this wonderful tour. And we're um, so appreciative of you two for, for showing us your church. And it's just beautiful. It has such an important history, historical significance to our town and our county. It really does. Yeah. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.